Welcome to The Joys of Binge Reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. Jessica Fallow's Mitford murder series has it all. The famous Blue Blood Sisters, fabulous fashion, murder, and a Downton Abbey-style TV series already in the planning. Not surprising when you discover that Jessica is already the author of five best-selling Downton show guides. Hi there, I'm your host Jenny Wheeler and today Jessica talks about mixing fact and fiction in her mysteries and how a former deputy editor of Country Life came to be writing murder mysteries in the first place. But before we get to Jessica, just a reminder, the show notes for this binge reading episode can be found on the website thejoysofbingereading.com. That's where you'll find links to Jessica's books and website, as well as details about how to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. But now, here's Jessica. Hello there, Jessica, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Jenny. Look, you've had a fascinating career as the official guide to all things Downton, and you've written a number of best-selling books about the TV series. We will get on to that a little later because I'm sure there's many readers who are fascinated by Downton, but this podcast is really focusing on mystery fiction, and so I'd really like to focus on your Mitford murders when did you decide to write fiction? And was there any once upon a time moment, like an epiphany where you thought, I've just got to start writing some some fiction? <laughs> um, I think it's one of those things that you kind of always have in the back of your mind that you would like to get to. But I've been a big, big reader for a long time. And I have a lot of respect for a lot of writers. And I just didn't even think I could come anywhere near you know getting getting close to what they were doing um so it was really a question of confidence I think as much as anything else uh and then and working out what my voice would be and what era I would do and what what the work of Downton Abbey did for me was that it really focused my research um on the 1920s which is an era I'd always had a fascination with but having that great big store of uh of knowledge after five years of working on the Downton Abbey books, you know, it made me think, well, I, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'll do it in the 1920s. Um, and I kind of, I had, a, I had somebody approach me and ask if I'd like to write a novel, and that got me quite excited a few years before, and um, I sort of had a go. But I've been a jobbing writer for such a long time. I sort of, I need the commission and I need the deadline, and so it was only really once the Downton Abbey books had finished. And I was thinking, <clears throat> now is the moment for what am I really going to do? Um, and then I was approached by an editor who asked me if I would be interested in writing a crime series with the Mitford sisters as the background. And what did I think of that idea? And when he said that, I thought, that's that's it. You know, I could just get it. Uh, and so that was that was the epiphany. That was the moment, you know. But the main thing was that, was that he was willing to kind of put the faith in me to have a go uh and he promised he would hold me by the hand throughout the, the process of the first novel you know so that hopefully I wouldn't embarrass myself too too much yeah. <laughs> at the end of it uh and so that's what got me off and now you know each time you get a little bit more confident and then and each time you enjoy it a little bit more yes there are very strong parallels obviously between Downton and the very famous Mitford sisters and the sort of life they led um, mm. And so I guess that the research, I can even see, having read the first two, there are various things that I see that there's a crossover. I mean, I noticed that one of the heroines in Downton has a secret love affair with a, a jazz singer from one of the nightclubs. And in Bright Young, Mur a Bright Young Dead, there's a, 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 an obviously a, 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 a 
jazz singer also named Jack. And there seemed to be some crossover there. Yeah. Uh, gosh, the Jack thing was was totally unintentional. But um, they were they were probably both based on a real life um, black jazz singer, singer called Hutch, who was in London um, a little bit later, actually, than Bright Young Deb. But I kind of, you know, sort of thought I could get away with it. He really came to London in 1926 and I'm in 1925. Um, but he he was a, a very brilliant jazz musician and very attractive. And he quickly got a reputation for having a, lots of affairs with upper class women. Um, and so I definitely wanted, I definitely wanted a little hint of that atmosphere. Um, I'll probably build on it a little bit more in the third book. But yeah, there are those kind of parallels. Um, but the thing is, you know, both Downton and the Mitford murders, you know, we are in the end essentially dealing with real life, you know, and real life events. We're not talking about aliens landing in the garden or anything. You know, we're trying to we're trying to put our characters around people who've actually existed. Yes. So there will be parallels. That, that's really fas- it's part of the fascination of the of the books, I think. And in the first one, that that event is the death of Florence Nightingale's goddaughter, Florence Nightingale Mm. Shaw, who was a dedicated nurse and from a good family who was beaten to death on a train. Now, I I believe that at that time, that must have been an extremely unusual sort of thing to happen. Um, And it's actually never been solved, that murder, has it? No. So, no, it was. It was. It was. It was. um, It was a big crime at the time. I mean, lots of people really um, were very upset and agitated by it. She was, as you say, she was a war nurse. She'd, in fact, she'd only been demobilised by two months. Um, so of course, we've just had all these big Remembrance Day mm. commemorations. Um, so I've been thinking about her a lot, actually. But, uh, you know, as a war nurse, she remained in France for another year because, of course, the war ended, but there were so many sick soldiers who just couldn't be moved from the hospitals and so on. So she, you know, she spent another year in the hospitals, even in peacetime. And having gone through all that and survived all of that, she takes the train from Victoria Station to go and see her friend by the sea um, and is left for dead before she ever, you know, reaches her destination. And and it was, it was absolutely, it was, you know, it was a closed door mystery. Uh, and they, they never, I mean, not only did they not solve it, but there were never any really very strong witnesses or credible suspects, you know, that the police investigated um, at the time. So it, re- it remained an unsolved murder until now, of course. <laughs> because you you gave your version of what happened. Yes, I've solved it, obviously, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. But it's, it's touching in a way because, you know, and it's why I've been thinking about uh, a lot in the last few days because I was pleased in some small way that this book would bring some attention to her work. Um, yes. Because she was a really remarkable woman, actually. Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, I, I must say that I got out a couple of the Downton books and I was flicking through them and I came across the photograph of when when the war ended and they were all standing there mem- remembering, you know, 11 11. Um, it, it was interesting just to realize that we'd only just seen that same anniversary on Sunday. Mm. I know. And don't you think it was extraordinary that exactly 100 years should land on a Sunday? Yes. You know, yes. Yeah. When it can be available to, you know, do this commemoration properly. I thought it was quite extraordinary, yes. actually. Yeah. Now, the second one, we're moving on in time a little, and, and that change in society that happened after the war, um, I, I know that Julian Fellows has called it a febrile sort of time where I guess people were struggling with trying to make sense of the huge loss of life and what how their lives had changed afterwards. So we get into an era where there are very racy jazz clubs and the underground and the upper classes rub shoulders in a way that perhaps before the war they never did. And you introduce Alice Diamond, the queen of crime who ran a female syndicate that they called the 40 Thieves. I mean, I think of of Dickens and and Oliver, but um, <laughs> <laughs> well, she was real. 
she was real. I mean, it was such a it was such an extraordinary discovery. I and mean, I was sort of doing some more research in, into that particular period, as you say. You know, it was this 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 sort of very unusual and rather intense period. As you had on the one hand, you had the older generations who were very much grieving for the life that physical life that had been lost, but also just the way of life that had been lost by because of the First World War. But then you also had these young people who did not remember life before and saw this time as an opportunity for change. It was a new decade after all the 1920s and all kinds of slow changes that had started before the First World War had suddenly now really escalated. Um, so women now had the vote. Because there weren't enough men, women were going out to work, to look after themselves. Uh, socialism was very much on the rise. Plus, you had all this exciting new technology. Um, Americans have been developing these products like Cadillac cars and refrigerators, and you know they were they were exporting all this over over to us in England. And so there was this real sense of something different happening. Um, and there was a breakdown. The war also created a kind of breakdown in in class, not completely, but just started to sort of shiver the roots of it a bit. Um, anyway, Alice Diamond was somebody that I discovered. She, uh, he ran this, as you say, this this female syndicate. So forty female thieves. So that they're Alice and the forty thieves. Um, they were all shoplifters, and. Alice Diamond was somebody, she came from a very tough working class background, um, very difficult background, but she liked to put on the posh, as she called it. So she would dress up and she would go off to this nightclub, the 43, the 43 was a real nightclub. Um, and, uh, and you know, that, that that's where the, you would get the gangsters and the upper classes all shimmying together on the dance floor. And I just, I just thought that was such a wonderful opportunity for a location as well. I love dancing. Um, and I love, you know, I used to love going to nightclubs when I was a bit younger, not quite so much anymore. But, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get on the dance floor if I ever get an opportunity. But because it does something different, it is very democratic music yes you know when you're all just there together it doesn't really matter who anyone is you're all just kind of experiencing the moment together yes. and I think that was something that felt quite new for them yes uh, yes yeah yes 43 sounded amazing and and um I looked into it a little bit I gather that the owner who had amazing backstory herself in, tr in truth she wrote a memoir of her life secrets of the 43 which was immediately banned on publication, allegedly because it told tales about too many prominent people. And, of course, being a former journalist myself, I immediately wondered, has it ever seen the light of day? Yeah, yeah, I've got it, I've got it. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I've got it. Um, it is, you know, no, it's great. I mean, she's kind of, you know, she's, she's, she, she quite likes to kind of self-glorify a little bit. But, you know... Um, she was quite exceptional. I mean, she was this Irish woman. She married a doctor. They came over to England. Something went wrong with the marriage. And she had three children. She had to bring up and pay for their education. Uh, and she kind of got into the nightclub scene. It was a sort of new thing. Just I think she got into it sort of around the beginning of the First World War um, and after. Uh, and she sort of, you know, she... She was cunning, really. I think she, she knew how to keep the police on side uh, so she could keep serving her alcohol even out of hours and so on. Um, and she, But she she was obviously also very charismatic because she did just have everybody come. And when she did go, she went to prison a couple of times, but every time she came out, there'd be this enormous champagne party thrown for her with judges and upper-class lords and, you know, and then all her dancing girls all together, you know, um, and all her... Daughters got married off extremely well. Yes, I, I read so that she, one married an earl and another a an baron. Yeah, so you know they didn't do too badly <laughs> out of it. Oh, that's, that that sounds wonderful. That sounds great. So, how important is it to you to to make it as historically accurate as you can? How much poetic license do you allow yourself when you're when you're getting into it? Um, I think. I mean, it's a very good question. I. I do try to be historically authentic, you know. I mean, with, with details like with the Florence Nightingale Shaw and Alice Diamond and things, um, you know, where those 
factual details exist. I mean, with the Florence Nightingale Shaw case, the court records themselves have been destroyed, but the newspapers used to do very detailed reports of inquests with transcriptions of the interviews and so on. And so, you know, it was absolutely, I used a lot of those interviews. Um, and I like to put in details that those who know will recognise as authentic, you know, and I think it, it, it kind of keeps the trust of the reader. And in some ways you're slightly cheating, you know, because you kind of, you, you can reel the reader in quite quickly yes. when they know yes. that something is yes. true. You know, it kind of it's more captivating in some way. Then you do have to be very careful not to abuse that trust by putting in something that, that's inauthentic. So I do try to be as historically truthful as possible. On the other hand, when it comes to, the Mitford sisters, I'm not writing a biography um, and because there are, if you want to read a Mitford biography, there are masses of them uh, brilliantly done. What I'm interested in is the gaps in between the facts that we know, you know, yes. what got them yes. from one point to another and imagining how they might have done that. So I know I try never to I try never to have anyone do anything that they really wouldn't have done in real life. Yes, I suppose the secret is that it could have happened, that it, that everything, yeah, yes. it could have happened, yeah. it could have happened. And the thing is, I do think, I do think it's a kind of, it's, uh, I'm allowed to do it if you like, because I, there is no such thing as a, as, a, as a single historical truth. No. You know, yeah. you know, everything has been seen from different angles by different people with different agendas. And, you know, even the Mitford sisters disagree with each other from minor details to major details. Uh, and so it's, it's I think, you know, it's allowed to kind of to, to have a little look through. But the, sto the story does have to matter. Yes. Uh, so I have sometimes changed dates and things. But if I've ever done that, I've made a I've sort of said it at the end of the book. Yes. In the historical. Yes. And I read somewhere that you plan to set one book around each of the Mitford sisters. Is is that the plan? Yeah, it is pretty much the plan, actually. I mean, you know, as long as everybody keeps buying them, I'll keep writing them. And there's, there's quite a lot of sisters. So. Yeah. And it'll be um, interesting but, to me to see how you manage to, to infiltrate Louisa into each one, because I presume she probably will remain a, a permanent um, feature. So somehow you've got to find a way for her to work for each of them. <laughs> I know, I know, you do, and it has to be, you know, and it does have to be sort of realistic, you know, as far as possible. But, yeah, no, I think I've, I think I've got a way yes. around it. Yes, I'm just about to embark on the third one now, with which will have Diana at its centre. Oh, that'll um, be fun. But I mean, what's great about them is because those Mitford sisters, each one of them represents something of that era, whether it's the politics or the glamour or the countryside or the aristocracy you know whatever it is and so each one really just acts as a hook um for me to hang my hat on if you like you yes. know we can just zoom into that world and get there quite quickly um and they sort of do half the explaining for me if you like you know and so louisa just needs to follow them in there uh and and but she's an inquisitive person and quite a daring person uh, and so I see no reason why she shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And the comment has been made that you might have a bit more of a challenge on your hands when it comes to unity. The sister mm. who so fervently admired Hitler that um, she shot herself when Britain declared war, didn't she? But sadly didn't yeah. manage to finish the job. So was it? No. I don't know if she did that because she admired Hitler. I think, you know, she just, she knew that war would be declared and she didn't want to see it. She knew this was the kind of the consequence of her. Yes. If you like, you know, she didn't, she didn't, she couldn't confront the, the consequence of her um, admiration for Hitler, um, which was war on her own country. And you know, she, she's definitely a very tricky character. Uh, you know, perhaps what we might, you know, have said then it's not quite all there. I think even yes, before. Yes. Do you I have any personal she... favourites among the sisters? Um, I, th you know, I think Pamela is definitely the, 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 the probably the the steadiest. Although Deborah was very sweet. I mean, you know, I've met quite a few people who met Deborah, and nobody's got a bad word to say about her. You know, I yes. think she probably was the nicest and of the most straightforward of them all. Um. Uh, Pamela I quite like she's got a slight sort of edge to her because she was quite sort of complicated in ways that only really came 
to the fore later in her life. But Nancy's the one that you'd want to go out and have cocktails with. I mean, she would be the funniest, I think. Yeah. You know, possibly you, you don't want to get on the wrong side of her, but uh, but you'd you'd get the most caustic wit yeah. kind of thing. Yes. <laughs> but as each book goes on, I you know I kind of find something with each one because you you have to. Although Diana is making me nervous, I have to admit. <laughs> Um, if you were going to organise a magical mystery literary tour, almost like the Downton Abbey guidebooks, and it may come to that, you know, once you've done some more of them, <laughs> where would you suggest that people would should go in Britain? Ah, oh, for the Mitford sisters. Well, yes. I mean, not far from where I live here in England, actually. So they they had a house, they lived in a house called Astle Manor, um, which is where the Mitford murders and Bright Young Dead is set, which is in Oxfordshire. Um, a very near place called with, with Astor um, and Swinbrook. And the house itself is a private house, although every other year they do this uh, summer sculpture exhibition in the garden. So you can go to that and you can go to the church at any time. And then there's a pub called the Swan at Swinbrook, which is mentioned in the books too. And that's a real pub. It's really nice um and very much aware of its Mitford legacy so those are that's a pretty good place to go and then if you're in London you should go to Mayfair uh the Haywood Hill bookshop which is where Nancy Mitford worked for a bit in the war it's the most adorable bookshop so it's worth popping into there oh that sounds <laughs> wonderful <laughs> <laughs> look turning to your wider career just moving on from focusing on the fiction you're a former deputy editor of Country Life and you've written for many prestigious publications. You've enjoyed great success with the Downton Abbey books. Tell us how that came about. I know that you did have a relationship with Julian, but just fill in for the readers how that came about. Well, I mean, um, so the Downton Abbey series was on television first aired in Britain, September 2010, which I remember because it was very shortly after my son was born. Um, and uh, and I watched the show like everybody else and loved it because my uncle, Julian Fellows, had written it. And to, he had mentioned the show to me a couple of times beforehand, but he's, you know, like most people in the film world, it's a little bit superstitious until an event has actually, you know, until the film is really made and happening. You just don't talk about it because all kinds of projects get cancelled at the last minute and so on. But he had a couple of times mentioned it to me, so I knew he was a bit excited about it. Anyway, I loved it. It quickly became this enormous, enormous hit, really quite ast astonishingly so. By about the third episode, it was being quoted in the House of Commons and so on. Um, and then uh, my agent, I was, a, you know, as, as you say, I was a journalist. Um, at that point, I was freelance and I'd, I'd, left the I'd left Country Life magazine, but I had been there for a few years. So I knew my way around big houses and so on. Um, Anyway, my agent heard that a deal was being done between the producers of Downton Abbey and, and a publishing house. And she said, but they don't have a writer, so maybe you should put yourself forward. So I emailed Julian and asked if he would mind if another fellow was on the project. Because, of course, you know, I'm nothing to do with the series itself. I have, Julian writes the scripts. Um, I've just written about the show and how it's made and the social history of the period and so on. Yes. Um, I'm not responsible for the death of Matthew. He is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, so that was it. Yeah, so that was it. He did Julian very sweetly endorsed endorsed the idea of me uh, writing the books. And because they did want this social history aspect, that was what really got me excited. I think I, would, I wouldn't really have been up for just a making of book. You know, it was going to be a bigger project than that. So it was amazing. It was great. It was great to have that have that work you would have been ideally suited with your background at country life obviously yeah and you've done a lot of <laughs> touring and public speaking on behalf of the show so I know that Julian's been asked this many times but can you pin down what fascinates people most about it what was the most common question that you got when you were speaking and touring on it well but, um the most common question is probably why is the show so successful? Yes, you know, yeah. we know the show would be so successful. Um, to which you know you can only answer, no, we didn't know the show would be so successful. I mean, if Julian had said in advance that he thought the show would be this successful, we'd have 
locked him up, you know, and yeah. it would have been mad <laughs> to assume that anything could become this successful, you know. I mean, it was just, a, you know, it was unprecedented, really. Um, as to why there's lots of different theories, I think in the end it was a very well-made show. It came at the right time. People needed that nostalgia. The world was a little bit uncertain at the time. If you remember, 2010, we were all pretty much in a recession of some kind. Um and there is something about that kind of, it's about family in the end, you know, family upstairs and family downstairs mm. and, you know, and mm. kind of relationships. And in, in the end, we got to go behind the net curtains, you know, and we were looking at something that was looked gorgeous and was beautifully acted and very well written and funny quite often. Yes. Um, but for also for a long, long time, until the very end of the series, the question that people would ask the most was, would Edith be happy? She became this kind of, anti-heroine and then heroine in a way you yes. know, where people just want to be sure that Edith would be happy so that was the cost I had a lot <laughs> <laughs> yes that's gorgeous yeah so you've you've obviously learned how to face challenges in your daily life I, I'm aware that you've also born with impaired hearing and you've really made a wonderful job of, of not even showing that you do have difficulty hearing um if there's one thing you've done in your working career more than any other that's the secret of your success, what would you think it is? Or just keeping on at it, Yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, J- Julian was always very um, instructive for me from an early age, I think, because, you know, he didn't get his success till quite late in life. He was 52, I think, when he got his Oscar. Um, and up to that point, he had had an okay career. You know, he was never out of work, but he wasn't this great big star that um, the Oscar got. You know, he won the Oscar for God's Pearl, and that sort of t- transformed his life really overnight. But what he taught me from that was just he said, he said, you must always be prepared for when that door it opens for you you know, be prepared so that you can walk through it. So he always had projects on the go. He was always writing something, knocking on people's doors, you know, trying different things out. And I think, you know, just to not be entitled, you know, not feel that this success is just going to come to you naturally. And when something successful happens, you've got to think quickly, how do I build on this? How do I make this last? Yes, Uh, yes. You know, so you have to... You know, so you just have to be disciplined. And I think what's been great for me as a novelist in lots of ways is having started as a journalist and a freelance writer, I'm used to creating my own work. And I'm used to just coming up and sitting down at my, just come up and sit down at my desk every single day and write and just write something. And sometimes you write something just unbelievably terrible, but at least it's something you can work with the next day. Yes. You know, and then you have a day where it feels like it's gone right, you know. Yes. Um, but you just want to sit at your desk. It's not going to happen unless you sit at your desk. Yes, sure. <laughs> Look, turning to Jessica as reader, because we call this the joys of binge reading, and it was partly prompted by that change in reading habits where people are tending to read series more. There is that phrase, the Netflix of fiction now, that people like to have the same instant gratification that you can get with watching the next program. Um do you like to binge read yourself? And if so, have you any recommendations for what other people might like to read? Well, I mean, I read very widely generally. Um, and actually, I've no, I've sort of shied away from series a little bit because I don't like having to get too committed to, you know, there's so many things on my pile yeah. of books mm-hmm. that I need to read that you think, oh, my God, if I get... You know, stuff that there are some read, there are some writers that I go back to, not as a series, but you go back and you just know when you read them, it's like getting into a warm bath. Yes. You know, it's just going to be easy and fun. Yes. So Joanna Trollop yes. is one of those. Yes. I absolutely love her books. Um, I've just read her, I've just read her latest one, Unmatched Marriage, I think, um, where, you know, she just got such nice observations about people. Yes. And then, but I, then I've also been reading a lot of, um, I've been reading a lot more crime recently, um, just because, I'm, you know, almost from an analytical point of view, you know, to read the good 
as um as well you know and read the bad as well try and work out what you know what works and what, and what, what doesn't work yes um uh, so i'm just trying to think which the most recently what i've read some good ones um Ooh, Our House by Louise Candlish, that was good. Place of Execution, Val McDermid. Val McDermid is, you know, oh, just yes, a brilliant yes. crime writer. Yes. She's someone to read again and again. Um, but non-crime, I have to say, people I've read recently that I've just adored, is um, Curtis Sittenfeld. She's the most brilliant writer, I think. She's got a book of short stories out at the moment called You Think It, I'll Say It. And then... I love American writers, I have to say. I do think they are great storytellers. I Am Lucy Barton by Elizabeth Strout. I was a bit late to the party with that one, but it, that was beautiful. And A Woman at the Window, I read by O.J. Finn. That was the crime, but that was good. I keep a little ledger of books that I've read. I've kept it since I was 16 because my memory... Is so bad for titles and authors. <laughs> I can always remember. Well, as soon as I see it, I can remember how I felt about it, but I can never somehow call anything to mind yes. straight away. Yes, um, yeah. But if you want a really good book on England and politics and people in England at the moment, sort of by political, I mean small politics yes. rather than government yes. politics. Um, the Lie of the Land by Amanda Craig. Really? It's just brilliant. Yes. Just brilliant. Yeah. 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 Particularly with Brexit and everything going on. If you want to understand what people are really like, that's that's fantastic. Oh, that sounds great. So there you go. That's your list. I've just added to your to your pile, I hope. Wonderful, thank you. I'm a bit the same as you. I mean I absolutely insist on reading at least one of the books of everybody I interview and sometimes two, but if they've done a whole series of six or seven, there's no way I'm going to be able to read them all, you know, just. <laughs> Too difficult. If I've got a really nice long holiday, I go away to Ireland for a few weeks every year and, and that's a great place for reading. Yes. You know, but of course, at the moment I'm having to read a lot of, well, it's very pleasurable, but I read a lot of books for research. Yes. Uh, so I'm seeking out out-of-print books usually. Yes. About the year. I try as much as possible for my research to read first-hand accounts yes. from the time yes. rather than a historian's review. Yes, yeah. Just to get those fun details. Look, Jessica, we're starting to run out of time. So if we're circling round to your beginning and then looking through to the end, at this stage of your career, if you were doing it all over again, what, if anything, would you change? Oh, I don't know. I'd do more radio, I think. I love radio, and I think I didn't um, I didn't pursue that when I could have. Um, but at the same time, I'm very much a believer that you make your choices in life, and this is where you are. And it's not too late for me to find a way of having a go at it. You know, so definitely not. Um, no, you could start a podcast. <laughs> start a yeah, start a podcast. Exactly. I feel incredibly lucky to be where I'm at. You know, I really got such a big, big break with the Downton Abbey books um i mean the thing for all of us on downtown was anybody who was connected to the show was a bit of a life-changing thing so um that had you know that has led to this if you saw that yes so that, yes it's got so I'm very grateful to it. a natural progression so what is next for jessica the writer <laughs> um well at the moment it very immediately i need to write the third book in the series which will be called cruel bodies focusing on Diana Mitford, and that will be out in a year's time, more or less. Um, and then I have got, a, you know, I've got uh, now that I'm starting to get a bit of confidence as a writer, I'm starting to think about other projects. I'd love to do um, TV scripts. So the, the series is being developed as a TV uh, show, hopefully. Um, the script is being written by somebody else, but we're, you know, talking to various interested parties so that's all looking pretty great so that would be that's a great opportunity really for me to get in and start to understand the world of tv in a different kind of way um and i'd love to i'd love to write tv scripts that would be fab it's a total natural for a tv series isn't it you can and i would imagine that having the association with downton it would have given you some appreciation of what a tv series requires 
Yeah, no, no, definitely, definitely. Although I think you can only, you should, you have to write the book, you know, with, and and I realise that even more as I go on, you know, they will always just adapt what they need, you know, yes. they'll make the changes necessary for a TV yes. series. You know, so, but, um, but I was excited just because I think it's a very visual period. It's such a good yeah. looking period, yeah. you know, yeah. which is kind of, you want to see it brought to life, you know. I'm already so. excited about the thought of it. It's It would be just great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So do you interact with your readers online? And if so, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me. Um, there's, I've got a, a Jessica Fellows author page on Facebook. Uh-huh, yes. Which is the, the thing I keep most up to date in terms of events and books and articles and, and so on. I'll do a link to this if you give it to me. Yes. And, uh, also at Jessica Fellows um, on Twitter, although I use that less, but I am there. And at official Jessica Fellows on Instagram, uh-huh. um, which I called it that because it just amused me to think there might be an unofficial Jessica Fellows somewhere. But... <laughs> anyway, I quite like Instagram actually. That's got that's quite fun. The main problem is not distracting myself with all these things when I'm supposed to be writing my book. Yes, but. But they are there. So no, I love I love interaction from readers. So questions, you know, fire them away. Come at me. I love it. That's wonderful. Look, thank you so much for your time. We have we've now thank reached you. the forty minute mark, so I think we'd better close. But um <laughs> <laughs> it was great to talk and I do think your series is going to be fantastic. I hope I'm oh, around to see it. So <laughs> Oh, thank you, Jenny. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. That's lovely, Jessica. Thanks for listening to the Joys of Binge Reading podcast. You can find all the details and links for this episode at www.thejoysofbingereading.com. We'd love to hear your comments and suggestions for who you'd like us to interview next. And if you enjoyed the show, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or a similar provider so you won't miss out on future guests. Thanks for joining us and happy reading. The Joys of Binge Reading podcast is put together with fantastic technical help from Dan Cotton and Abe Raffles. Dan is an experienced sound and video engineer who's ready and available to help you with your next project. Seek him out at dcaudioservices at gmail.com. That's D for Daniel, C for Charlie, audio services at gmail.com or check our show notes. He's fast, he takes pride in getting it right and he's great to work with. Our voiceovers are done by Abe Raffles, another gem of sound and screen. Abe has 20 years of experience on both sides of the camera slash microphone. As a cameraman director and also as a voice artist and TV presenter. I think you'd agree that his voice is both light-hearted and warm. He is super easy to work with, no matter what the job. You'll find him at abe, A-B-E, at pointandshoot.co.nz. As I say, the full details in the show notes on the website. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Hopefully see you next week. Bye.